Okay, here we go. We've already talked about several things in the first part of this video. And in this video, we're going to talk about total internal reflection. And we're going to use Snell's law in order to interpret some of the results. Just a reminder, what we talked about in the first video was refraction. Helped us explain why this straw looks like it's broken at the interface between the air and the water. We also used Snell's law and introduced it in order to put some of the mathematics behind this refraction and the bending of light. This is the video where we're going to talk about total internal reflection. This is a situation where you can effectively trap light, at least for a short period of time, inside of a material of high index of refraction. We use this to communicate with fiber optics and so this is a pretty big deal for a lot of technology. In the first video we talked about how you can travel from a low index of refraction into a high index of refraction. You will always be able to do that. Light always has a chance, a probability of penetrating into the high index of refraction material and then refracting, bending at that interface. I use the word can in this situation because it's not required to do that. There's also a probability that when it hits the new interface, it's going to reflect. That's a property of waves. Anytime you hit a new medium, some of the energy will be reflected and some of the energy will be uh, transmitted. And so the reflection part means it goes off angle in equals angle out measured against the normal, but the refraction part is the transmission of energy in this case. We'll go back to this diagram that you've seen before from the previous video, but this time we're going to be talking about when light travels from the water side of things into air. So we're going from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction. If light is coming in and traveling on the normal, so that's perpendicular to the surface, no matter what direction it's going, it's going to just travel straight on through. And you can actually show that using Snell's law, that the only way to make the mathematics work out for that is that sine of zero equals sine of zero. Both sides of the equation have to get wiped out and go to zero. We're going to take a look at a situation though where we actually put a little bit of bend onto this thing. Just like you're accustomed to, you know that we should get some bending of light. Here I am just starting to slightly increase the angle that I'm taking, my incident angle. That's the water side of things for this particular video. You'll notice that as I increase the angle a little bit on the side of water, the angle increases by more on the air side of things. Remember that you can always match the high index of refraction with the low angle and the low index of refraction with the high angle. So as I keep pressing my luck here, I'm able to move this angle out more and more. And you can see that I'm starting to run out of room to increase my angle on the air side of things. And then this is the one where I'm showing the most extreme. I technically have a lot more room that I could shoot a photon at the water air interface here on the bottom left of this picture. However, I've run out of room on the top right where I'm able to actually bend my light out and refract it into the air. Something else happens once you go beyond this situation. That is, and we've alluded to it already, total internal reflection. In this situation, light is going to reflect back into the water. The angle that it enters at, the incident angle, is going to be equal to the reflected angle measured against the normal. That's actually the law of reflection. But this is total internal reflection. The, the reason why the word total is there is because all of the light has to do this. There is no probability that the light will escape. And then from here, as I start to increase the angle of incidence, I'm taking wider and wider angles. You can see that the law of reflection just holds and it continues to reflect out. We'll put up Snell's law again and we'll see if we can get any information out of Snell's law in this particular situation. Snell's law really is dealing with the refraction part of things. And so we have to take it back a little bit 
and let's go to the last possible chance we had to actually refract light and get it up into the air. This is an extreme case where on the upper right we now have a right angle, a 90 degree angle, and so I can go ahead and put sine of 90 degrees into that. I'm also going to get rid of my generic variables N1 and N2, and I'm going to put in the actual indices of refraction that I have for air and water. Notice that I've also changed my theta1 to say theta c. The c is for critical, and we now call this thing the critical angle. So that is, anytime I have my refraction on the low index of refraction, the air in this case, equal to 90 degrees on the other side, it has to be theta c, the critical angle. The critical angle is the largest angle of incidence that you can have before this thing has to start exhibiting total internal reflection. So there's only one critical angle for any combination of materials, water to air, there's only one. So in fact, let's go back and find out what is it for water to air. I'll do a little bit of algebra just to simplify this down. Again, I'm going to use the inverse sine function to find out that the critical angle for water going into air is 49.3 degrees. Different materials are going to have different critical angles. Light pretty easily gets stuck inside of a diamond, which is why it bounces around so many times, and then eventually it'll find a way out. But it flies out of all the different corners of a diamond, and so when you cut it in very special ways, it looks very sparkly. And then, of course, we pay lots of money for it. Just remember, the critical angle is only that one angle. Anything beyond that is just going to exhibit reflection according to angle in equals angle out. I want to take a peek at a situation here that I've always thought was pretty fun whenever I was in a pool as a kid or something like that. If you look relatively straight up when you're underwater inside of a pool or in the ocean, you'll be able to see the outside world. The light that you see has to enter your eye. That means the arrowhead is going into your eyeball, always. So the drawing that I have here shows that light is coming from the outside world. It's refracting into the water and then it's going into my eyeball. But I could see what's going on. I could see uh, some palm trees out of the water if I was in a swimming pool. When you stop looking straight up and you look a little bit further out, there's no possible way for light to get from the outside world into your eyeball. And so you're left with a situation where there's, there's going to be some light, probably, that gets into your eyeball. But where did it originate from? It originated from light that totally internally reflected from down below somewhere. And so over here, we would have perhaps the bottom of the pool or the ocean floor. Light is coming up from there, and it's going to totally internally reflect and it's going to go into your eyeball. And so sometimes when you are underwater, you see the outside world. Sometimes you're going to see what's actually below you. This idea brings us to something that sometimes people call Snell's window, where if you look relatively straight up, you're going to see the outside world. And in this particular picture, it looks like a Harrier or some sort of airplane. But if you look a little bit further out, say where I'm pointing here with the the arrow, you have to be seeing locations underneath the water where light was actually reflecting off of that surface and coming into your eye. And so you actually have this very narrow window called Snell's window where you can see into the outside world. This is going to serve as a summary for both videos. Remember that light must refract if it hits an interface at an angle. and We kind of showed why that's the case in the first video. But we can use that type of information to help explain why it looks like this straw is bent as it's sitting in the, the glass. We've used Snell's law a few times. It's a pretty straightforward equation. And it helps us understand refraction. And we can also use it to understand the critical angle, which is the thing that's going to lead us into total internal reflection. Again, total internal reflection is a pretty important thing uh, for technology. As usual, if you think you've got it figured out, let your computer know.